Hi, everybody. My name is Alex Elliott. I am the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, which is a nonprofit university in San Francisco. It's my pleasure to welcome you all this evening to On Indigenous Voices and Restoring the Kinship Worldview. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those who were forcefully brought to this continent, we, CIIS Public Programs, must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional, unceded Ramatush Ohlone lands. If you're interested in learning more about Native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Now let me first introduce our presenters, Four Arrows and Darsha Narvaez, and then we will get right to their conversation. Darsha Narvaez is Professor Emerita of Psychology at the University of Notre Dame. She researches moral development and human flourishing from an interdisciplinary perspective, integrating anthropology, neuroscience, clinical development, and educational sciences. She is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and the American Educational Research Association and former editor of the Journal of Moral Education. She has numerous publications, including hundreds of chapters and articles and more than 20 books, such as Indigenous Sustainable Wisdom, First Nation Know-How for Global Flourishing, Basic Needs, Well-Being and Morality, Fulfilling Human Potential, and Embodied Morality, Protectionism, Engagement, and Imagination. A recent book, Neurobiology and the Development of Human Morality, Evolution, Culture, and Wisdom, won the 2015 William James Book Award from the American Psychological Association and the 2017 Expanded Reason Award. She blogs for Psychology Today, hosts the webpage evolvednest.org, and is president of kindredworld.org. Wahingpe Topa, Four Arrows, also known as Don Trent Jacobs, is internationally respected for his research and publications about indigenous worldview. Formerly Dean of Education at Oglala Lakota College and a tenured associate professor of education at Northern Arizona University, Four Arrows is currently a professor with Fielding Graduate University. Selected as one of 27 visionaries in education for the Arrow Text Turning Points, he is author of 21 books, half of which are about indigenous worldview applications for education, sustainability, wellness, and justice. He is a recipient of a Martin Springer Institute for Holocaust Studies Moral Courage Award for his activism on behalf of indigenous peoples and sovereignty. Four Arrows has Irish and Cherokee ancestry and is a maid relative of the Oglala Lakota who has fulfilled his Sundance vows and is an Oglala pipe carrier. And now it is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to Darsha and Four Arrows. Wow, Darsha, it's so uh, great to be with these folks. They've been so amazing in this half hour of prep that we've had and I can just imagine uh, who's out there in the audience listening to us. You know, I usually end some of our presentations and interviews that we've had together with uh, the Cherokee lullaby that was sung by the women on the Trail of Tears. I I'd like to start uh, with that instead today. Is that okay with you? That sounds good. All right, I, I think that it, it will set the tone uh, for the conversation uh, let people know that during the most difficult of times, as certainly the Trail of Tears was, seeing the beauty and the responsibility of all the other creatures. And that's what the lyrics to this song were about. Did you see the animals in the clouds? Did you see the dancing grasses? Did you see the beautiful colors of the, the fish and hear the sounds of the birds? And uh, I think it's important to remember that uh, no matter how difficult things are and our, and, and our conversation is going to be talking about difficult things, um, that it's important to remember that we're not alone and that there's beauty all around. So I'd like everyone to tune in and uh, uh, participate by just being a part of understanding and remembering this wisdom of the women on the Trail of Tears singing this song. Breathe deeply.
You know, I, uh, yesterday, um, I was doing some work outside and I walked in to the house and my wife was uh, watching a documentary or something on the, 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 the screen and uh, it was interrupted with a press conference. And the press conference was uh, uh, in the mid talking about the gun violence that would happen in New York and stuff like that. But as I was starting to walk out, one of the journalists, one of the gentlemen journalists asked the question um, uh, to, I think Jen Psaki is the, is, the, is the lady with the beautiful red hair, they call her. Um, uh, he, he said that, uh, um, what is the president doing? What is President Biden doing to, um, to deal with the uh, lack of humanity for, for humans? That we're, uh, what, what, what is he really doing about that? And as I walked out, I thought, well, that's, that was a, probably a good question in many ways. But it really made me think about what we're going to be doing today. And, and, I, and I want to start with this idea of this, this focus on humans only, I think is maybe one of the greatest challenges that we have in, in re-embracing the worldview that guided us for, as you say, 99% of human history. That... that um, if, if we can understand that this kinship that we talk about in our book, that, that restoring of the kinship, uh, really brings about a much broader idea. Uh, and I wanted to just, uh, you know, talk about how the, you know, the, the mysterious creating energy that, you know, we refer to. Uh, in indigenous cultures, it's almost always as a, as a great mysterious thing, sort of a verb even, um, that, that uh, this energy used the stars and the rivers and the mountains and the plants to, to teach us how to live in a good way. And, 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 I, and I just wanted to read an excerpt from our chapter 9 and our chapter 11. Chapter 9 is, opens with uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, from the Potawatomi Nation. Uh, it's entitled, All Earth Entities Are Sentient. She says, the taking of another life to support your own is far more significant when you recognize the beings who are harvested as persons, non-human persons vested with awareness, intelligence, and spirit, and who have families waiting for them at home. Killing a who demands something different than killing an it. When you regard those non-human persons as kinfolk, another set of harvesting regulations extends beyond bag limits and legal seasons. That's just a, a portion of her opening quote. Uh, and similarly, uh, Professor LeBlanc, uh, himself a Christian theologian, is critical of the anthropocentrism in our world, especially in our, our religions. Uh, and he, he writes in chapter 11, uh, uh, and this is a, an excerpt from it. The title is Non-Anthropocentrism, um, and Terry is uh, uh, a Micmac. Uh, he, he says the creation itself is groaning. This, Native people would argue, characterizes the lived theology of the majority of the evangelical church, even today, as it has done through the ages. It's precisely this framework that allowed Christian missionaries to cross large bodies of water to where if they had not brought God, God would not have been present. How is it that the Christian church could articulate this principle of, uh, of the omnipresence of God and yet call us godless heathens in a godless heathen land? If I had a platform to do so, he says, I would want to cry loudly that it is in the rest of creation then that we find the gifts of the Spirit most consistently manifest to teach us to talk about the past and the present. We find this expression in the natural way of life, which creatures living in a more intuitive relationship with this Creator tend to express. Why don't you ask the birds in the air, the fish that swim in the sea, the animals that walk on the land, speak to the earth itself? Which of these do not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. My grandfather and people of this generation used to say that animals are indeed persons. They're not just people. So with that opening of this very difficult subject of a non-anthropocentric worldview, uh, 
very difficult to grasp, even when you're trying to ask an important question like the journalist was yesterday in the press conference. So, Darsha, from from a developmental standpoint, uh, uh, and, and your specialty, in what ways can we broaden this uh, idea of, of a sense of kinship with childbearing and child child raising. I mean, that would be, it seems a, to be a, a starting place for us. Yes, it's uh, really a vital. These days, we aren't providing what children need really to foster their full potential, which includes a sense of, of the living earth. Our past was uh, in most of societies were spent uh, living in partnership with the natural world uh, and treating them as persons, as you say. And what we've done is we've undermined that early life experience. Um, so the brain just doesn't develop all the systems well, and we get very self-centered as a result because we don't feel quite right. We're dysregulated on multiple levels, and I can say more about that later. But I think we have to explain what we mean then by this kinship perspective, it's the embracing of the whole, of feeling part of the cosmos. It's feeling part of uh, the dynamism of, of the universe, essentially, and having a sense of the mystery and the, the movement and partnership. Uh, and we've lost that because we disconnect children, babies in particular, uh, from early life, and they, they, their continuum of feeling connected is broken by leaving them alone, leaving them to cry, not uh, touching them all the time pretty much in early life, and not letting them wander in the natural world and connect. Uh, so there's so many ways that we've uh, pulled people away from our true nature, which is being Earth-centric. Well, so just what what, uh, what I was saying earlier about the origin stories of all the cultures that I've lived with and and studied, um, that that the the original kind of wisdom was uh, from the animals, from the trees, from the rivers and and the mountains and the winds. Imagine if a child, from the beginning, you know that there was this kind of assumption that it's not going to be me. Uh, uh, or you know the other parent, or the teachers, or the books, or the documentaries, or that's going to give you the main information. It's it's going to be, and in fact, you learn that you know from six months on. And and uh, I mean, in a way, I did this with with my daughter and horses. I mean, from the time she was able to be in a front pack, uh, you know, she was on on horses, and horses were were our te were our teachers. And of course, in the wilderness, we would bump into other other creatures but uh has have, have you ever been able to at, at notre dame talk about how parents uh do use uh, you know i mean certainly the, the 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 storybooks are all cartoon animals it seems like that so it seems like there's something there but uh you know i just want parents that are out there and, and and that that have young children to be able to say this you know even if they their computers turn off in five minutes that wow this is some place that we can go well we do have an uh we uh, in our book we talk about child connection to nature right we have a, a viola cordova's example she gives of of oh, two yeah. mothers yeah, can, can, can you read that? That's a, that's a great yeah, so example. Yes, I have to find it. Uh, let's see. Um, it might take me a minute because I'm not sure where it is. But I can, uh, maybe I'll just read. Is it, I think it's chapter one. Isn't it the first one? Uh, no, it's, I don't think it's that one. That, that's a the, different thing. That's oh, the, oh, yeah, that was could, where the... Yeah, we could talk yeah. about that too. But uh, in terms of the nature connection, specifically, um, she was giving an example of the two mothers. The, uh, the indigenous mother takes her baby to the, uh, let's say, a, a local park, because that's where they live, and introduces the baby, the young child, to the trees, to the animals there, the plants, and lets the child explore on the, in the dirt and, uh, you know, uh, expects the child to honor and uh, the well-being of the other Non, the non-humans, the other than humans. 
then the other mother is a Western raised um, a dominant culture person who takes her child to the same place and then uh, puts down a blanket and then says, don't touch that. That's dirty. Don't don't go over there. That's dangerous and introduces the child to the natural world in a very distinctive way, right? And I think that's sort of embedded in our Western kind of culture over the last hundreds of years. Nature is dangerous. Nature is not us. <laughs> it's inferior and all that kind of cultural assumptions that we come to nat the natural world with. Yeah, get out the bug spray and make sure there's no snakes <laughs> around. <laughs> that's right. Ew. <laughs> Well, you know, it kind of reminds me of, uh, uh, you know, that I've done this a lot uh, where I'll go to, in, into a, a classroom or a presentation somewhere and, and I'll ask, I'll have pre-scouted out a place where there's bushes or trees. And I'll ask people, set their stuff down and go out the hallway and turn left and go out the doors and touch a tree and come back. And people will do this with, you know, a little bit of dismay in their eyes. And when they come back, they... Uh, start to sit down and I, I stop them and I say, forgive me, but I want you to do this one more time. And, uh, and I promise it's the last time. I want you to go out again and touch a bush. You can do be the same one or a different one, but this time I want you to ask permission and do so sincerely and wait for some kind of an answer. Oftentimes people will guffaw or laugh and, and uh, it's when I do it with, you know, some of the tough kids and, and uh, adjudicated kids, they'll, 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 uh, they'll, they'll, they'll say some more strong words, but I, I'll tell you, I've done it so many times. And when people come back, there's always a tear in someone's eyes. Uh, there's always a certain silence, a certain respect for listening to how people re re talk out. And the stories that people say about getting a feeling uh, that, that, a tree or a bush actually said something or gave that permission. And then when they touched it, they had a special feeling. And, uh, and so, you know, we're, it's in our DNA. And so the, this, this is the nature based worldview that is in our epigenetics and, uh, and probably in our genetics. And I think that uh, um, it's, it's not quite as crazy as it might sound. Right. And what I discovered in my work integrating across sciences is that when you under care for a child, that means you're n you don't provide what our species evolved to provide, what we call the evolved nest. So that's soothing birth, breastfeeding for several years, a welcoming social climate uh, of the multiple adult caregivers. and and who are responsive, free play, social play with, in the natural world and the healing practices and lots of positive touch. When you don't provide that system of care, then you develop, uh, the systems get underdeveloped and the child is easily triggered into fear, easily triggered into, uh, and then anxiety and depression over time. And it, there's, the Nazis knew that this was a great way to raise kids because you could control them later. They don't remember what happened in those first years of life because our, the way our brain is developing, you don't have the verbal knowledge, but your body remembers and you, you easily go into the bracing mode. And we've established that as a way to raise children in the Western world and wherever we've been ref, Westernized. And then we can't open our hearts to the natural world, to one another, to uh, who we are, our real selves, or we don't develop ourselves very well. We find things that make us feel safe. And we can see the triggering going on in so many adults now in the United States. And uh, it's very distressing because the, you don't think very well when the stress response kicks in, the blood flow shifts away from your higher order thinking to your muscles so you can run or fight, you know. And, and physiologically then we're setting people up not to reach their full human nature, which is a kin centric way of being. So the more fear, the less, the less heart, uh, the, the less trust, certainly uh, starting at young age and moving on into adulthood with all the phobias that are, that are listed in the DSM, uh, we, we, we are not going to respond to 
a strange looking creature, whether it be a caterpillar or a mouse or a cockroach or a dog uh, in, in, a, in a way that our, our, our first inclination is to be interested and curious and to maybe even be willing to want to learn from. Instead, it's as you said, it's this guardedness. And then, and that continues because, you know, during the first few years of life, we are literally, uh, you know, walking hypno hypnosis machines. That, I mean, that's why we can learn 10 languages in the first five years. And, and that, that skill we'll talk about later is, is really uh, something that indigenous people understood that willful determination uh, it was not sufficient to really become a fearless person, to become a generous person, to become skilled at diff different things. It required a combination of cognitive ability and this meditative or trance-based uh, imagery. You know, Einstein said, you know, imagination is more powerful than knowledge. And they understood that. And, and, and all, without knowing the neuroscience of, of, of the phenomenon of hypnosis, which I, of course, taught at UC Berkeley for MFCC licensures, um, we use ceremony because ceremony is essentially going into that lower brainwave frequency with an intention and an image and imagining it in ways that can, can heal or bring us to those those places. So even though we're talking about early childhood and, and infancy, uh, we still have that skill, all creatures do. Uh, I, I learned it from wild horses, as you know. Um, but we still have that skill, and we'll come back to how these things we're talking about aren't just uh, at the early ages. We can, we can begin to turn around now, but it's a lot harder. Right. So ceremony for a baby is, is being carried in the arms of the parent and falling asleep and feeling safe and the, secure and that they can relax and let let go of any anxiety. Uh, and so when you leave a baby alone to sleep alone or crying, they don't get that feeling, right? They don't have this, oh, totally letting go feeling, which is part of that uh, way of interacting with the natural world that is so healing. You know, when you earth, when you lie on the ground and you feel like oh, you just uh, disappear into the earth, that's the feeling we want. That's the oxytocin flowing uh, and various other hormones that give us a sense of being okay. And a lot of kids never get that feeling because they're always worried if they're going to be left alone now or how long will it be. And so that, you know, it's just a lot of dysregulation and disorder and fear. And so when they meet the ant, they stomp on the ant instead of watching and learning from that. And then as adults, we, we stomp on each other and we, and, uh, and that's what we're doing with the wars, with the, with the shootings, uh, all of this right. is happening. And, you know, and, uh, it's never too late to, to learn is sort of an adage that I believe in. Uh, and, uh, um, I think that, that, that if we could change the language, for example, if that journalist had asked the press secretary, um, you know, uh, is, is the president doing anything about this, this, uh, terrible treatment of humans against humans. If what if what if that would have been the commonplace to say, what is the president doing about helping Americans see this the, the, the sacredness of, of all life? You know, just as subtle as that sentence would have been, you know, millions and millions of people saw it, it would start to trigger uh, this this phenomenon. You know, I remember when I was uh, given a presentation with three soil scientists about the, the degradation of our of our soil. Um, I was on a panel with with with, uh, with the three of them, uh, and I went last. And, and after they were done, I got up and I showed a slide, um, uh, and I kind of winked at them and I said to the audience, I said, you know. I learned a lot from these three engineers, soil engineers, uh, vital information for us all to know about uh, the loss of nutrition in the soil, etc. I said, but you know what they're telling us, all that information, it's not going to, it's not really going to make a difference. And I kind of winked at them so they knew I was saying so in a loving way, not in a critical way. And then I, I showed a slide in which I had uh, Theor Franklin Roosevelt, I think it was, yeah, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Wendell Berry, 
and Mahatma Gandhi, three people that I respect, you know, historical figures that I respect for their concern about soil. They've, they've all talked about it. And, uh, and so I showed the first three, and, and the, uh, Roosevelt said, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. I don't know if that sounded like Roosevelt or not, but, uh, and then Gandhi said, to forget how to dig the earth and tend the soil is to forget ourselves. Wendell Berry, the great uh, environmental uh, philosopher said, without proper care for the soil, we could have no life. So I showed that to him and I said, these are the kinds of things that our three soil engineers just told us. Um, but are they gonna make a difference? It, it, because it, we're making this assumption that worldview, and we'll talk about what worldview is for our, our, our friends in the, uh, that are out they're listening to us. Um, the fundamental way that we understand our relationship to nature and to each other and to supernature, if you will, um, wasn't, was, was reflecting the dominant worldview that we gotta take care of the soil so we'll be healthy. So then I read them a, a presentation that a portion of Chief Seattle's speech and I'll try to see if I can remember it. I'm not gonna do it justice and I, I should find it, but he said something like, every part of the soil is sacred uh, to my people. Even the rocks thrill, he said, thrill with memories of, of, of stirring events uh, connected uh, to, to, to the lives of, of my people. And, the, and I remember the last sentence, and the very dust upon which we stand responds lovingly to our footsteps. And I asked the audience, can you see a difference between that one and the other three? And hands raised and people got it, you know, they got it. So, um, you know, I think if, 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 if we can really promote uh, this idea of, of world view being the fundamental baseline that we have not used, instead we're using a baseline that really started with the colonization that has put us in so much trouble. Do you remember when we did the baseline work a lot when we first met? No. <laughs> yeah, what did we, we do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we talked about uh, what would be a, a, a good baseline, and we referred to the to the indigenous worldview, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, as a baseline. And I think that's where where we're at. Um, uh, and uh, and I, I think that if, if if we can just take a few minutes to talk about what worldview is mm -hmm. um, for and then show our worldview chart. And so I know Lyle, you're, you're ready to show it to everybody so they can kind of get a sense of what we're talking about. What we're gonna show um, to the folks out there is the worldview chart that we put together. It's based on a lot of research from uh, first contact reports. You know, for example, Columbus talked about how generous the indigenous people were, you know, and, and uh, uh, we've got those, but also a lot of scholarship uh, from the anthropologists that weren't anti-Indian and, and seeing through the dominant worldview and call it causing, uh, referring to them as, as savages. Uh, uh, I, I just grabbed my University of Texas book and opened up to some of the things that people have said about indigenous people that make them reluctant to want to look at an indigenous kinship-based, nature-based worldview. Keeping in mind that we're not talking about place-based knowledge that can be misappropriated because only people that speak the language and have been in one place for a long time can know place-based knowledge. We're talking about the in common worldview that those many cultures share. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and that's been put down, uh, you know, as, as ignorant savages for most of our, of our life until very recently. For example, um, uh, Christy Turner from the University of Utah uh, talked about uh, man corn, cannibalism and violence in prehistoric uh, uh, Southwest. Um, uh, so did uh, Stephen LeBlanc. He talked about constant violence, cannibalism and warfare among the Puebloans uh, in, his, in his book. Uh, uh, so here's a, a one by Lawrence Keeley, Civil, civilian massacres that prove humanity of humans is a product of civilization and uh, governments that overcame the horrors of primitive life. Um, here's oh, that, one I get, I get, my blood starts to boil when I hear that because yeah, it's I mean, mistaken. 
Exactly. And they just go on and on. I mean, UCLA, child abuse and other social maladies were far more pervasive in primitive societies than ours and proved the superiority of Western culture. And of course, we go on and on in, in the book on learning the language of conquest. And so when we talk about worldview, we and, and we talk about a binary of the dominant precepts of worldview that are scholarly, uh, uh, you know, we have scholarly sources for, and the indigenous people will say, well, wait a minute, isn't that a dangerous uh, binary? And it is if you look at it through our dominant worldview, you know, the George Bush either with, with us or against us, you know. Uh, the indigenous worldview, according to the scholarship, is a non-binary worldview. So rightfully, some of my liberal friends will say, well, well, wait a minute, you're showing us these 40 precepts and you're saying this is better than these, isn't that exactly you know the problem of, of our world? And we see it has been. When science and religion fought their worldview battles, it was about stopping dialogue. What we're looking at is the sacred space between the continuum of where we all are. None of us are immune to to the anthropocentrism or the materialism or the things that are on the left side of the chart. Even if in our hearts we feel different, we're, we are buying into that worldview, the colon, coloniality uh, uh, worldview. Whereas as we look at the other side, we see that as a continuum and we look at it in that way of finding complementarity. And so we're opening a dialogue. So let's show that, that yes, chart. Yes, showing it, yeah. Yeah. And so if you think about when are, if we have, what problems we're having with our, our environment and our eco ecosystems and with wars and with each other, uh, you know, we can, we can take and begin to understand and talk about, well, to what degree is a rigid hierarchy problematic here or helping or not? And, and in how, what, what ways can we move into a non-hierarchical way. And you can just look down this list um, and, and get a sense of, now I had somebody in the clinical psychology program I, I was teaching about decolonizing curriculum. And right away someone said, well, Four Arrows, you know, I'm not on the left side of this and nor is our program. And I could hear some him and hawing of her colleagues uh, and, uh, and you can move it down to the next 20, Lyle. And, so that the folks out there can can see the the second group, um, and uh, uh, you know, and and we you know we uh, are not emphasizing rights; we're emphasizing responsibility and stuff like this. And uh, I didn't say anything. I just kind of let her colleagues point out some differences that they had of opinion. But then, about an hour later, she said, "Oh, I see. These dominant worldview manifestations." describe our our systems they describe our education our economics our movies our folklore the way we interact with each other it doesn't necessarily mean it's how we feel or what we feel is right and i kind of wanted to say duh yeah you know of course but i think it's real important to recognize that we are all in the same boat and that space between these two opposites should be looked at for seeking complementarity and as sacred space. So I, can I clarify a few things? Yeah. The, the list on the right, the common indigenous worldview manifestations are practices that our species has employed for 6 million years, or at least 2 million years. Uh, since Homo sapiens came into existence. This is the way we survived, we thrived, we uh, adapted over generations. This is what helps us exist as a species. The left side is killing us. <laughs> the left side of the diagram is where we've been for, especially the last few hundred years, is super charged on the left side. And it's, it's, it's detached from the earth. It's dissociation. It's all the trauma that's been passed on generation to generation in the last millennia from uh, slavery, 
from the cruel hierarchy, from neglecting children more and more over time, less and less breastfeeding, for example, less and less touching and carrying children, all that is affecting brain development. And then you end up with adults that aren't so great at taking care of their kids. And it gets worse over generations. So the left side is uh, an aberrant <laughs> way of being on the earth, right? It's destroying everything. And the right side is our heritage. Well, and, and for those people who are saying, well, it doesn't, it doesn't that get into a strict binary? Because that position is, is the first position that anyone would think about. And it's, and it's certainly true, everything that you've said. However, in indigenous worldview, people look at opposites always as a complementary, no matter how, as a, as a potential complementarity, uh, no matter how opposing they are, because they say that in some ways, some of those things that we are doing that are ab abhorrent, that are destroying our world, that there's something in there that we can use to manifest a better way of operating in a more balanced and healthy way. Well, um, we can we can see yeah. that sometimes hierarchy is useful. So the the book that we've brought up in our talks before, uh, the Dawn of Everything, by David Graeber and David Wengro, just out anthropologist and a uh, um, archaeologist, uh, they. Uh, uh, talk about how in our past there's evidence that we didn't we're not on this progressive linear kind of evolution of human societies that's false they're showing us evidence that there are societies that were uh, egalitarian bands for half the year and then they got together for a few months and they had a hierarchy and then they went back to the bands right of egalitarianism and egalitarianism is part of we evolved with big social brains so we could be egalitarian. It's really our uh, part of our heritage, too. But this idea that we're on a progressive linear, there's nothing we can do. Going back is, you know, consider, oh, it's just romantic dream. No, there are people who live like this now, right? And uh, it's so it's the Western view is so rigid about its worldview. That we, that our idea for this book was to try to awaken people to the fact that these are things that we, our species knows, you know, it's deep down in our bones, it's in our ancestors, and we can bring it back. We don't have to be the way we are. We don't have to be killing off everything. We can actually come back, restore our sense of connection, restore our healing capacities to be with one another, to be actually open and connected instead of bracing against each other. And there's a lot of things we can do to heal. Uh, and we talk about a lot of those things in the book. Right, and we can dispel the myth of progress and see that this last eight to 9,000 years has been a devolution, if you will, uh, into uh, something that we don't know what sense of complementarity it may afford, but whatever it is, it has us in a tragic tragedy uh, and at the edge of, of, of an extinction. Uh, and, Nomad, uh, yeah, nomadic yeah. foragers, don't, don't let big egos happen, right? They are fiercely egalitarian. They keep that ego from inflating because they say it's going to be dangerous. It'll be dangerous if this successful hunter thinks he's better than the rest of us. And yet we have a world full of big egos running us into the ground, right? Uh, exterminating all of us. Well, and the, the, the colonialization is something that we, are, we have to be aware of, that it's not just about uh, identifying the problems, it's about what was before colonization. And that's what our worldview is, uh, is all about. What was, what was lost? What was lost to us? And how can we get that, get that back? And since, you know, the destruction of life systems, water, air, is such a crucial thing. I think it's important to mention that the largest study ever done was the recent May 2019 released the United Nations Biodiversity Report. And it clearly said, if you go uh, put in uh, what the media missed, uh, the nation, you'll see uh, an article I wrote uh, 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 that identifies six places in the, in the text where they said, where indigenous worldview is able to operate 
and, con and is still remembered, the extinction rate is non-existent or severely re reduced. Um, and this is, you know, 15,000 peer-reviewed papers, 450 interdisciplinary scientists, uh, and, you know, from 50 countries. So you know, we, w the evidence is there. And like you, you referred to, the, to Graeber's book, you know, the, it, it wasn't there was just naked gatherer hunters running around uh, in ways that we would never want to go back to. They, they did uh, sustainable agriculture. They just didn't do surplus. They had uh, complex systems and, 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 and governments. Uh, but when we look at one of the studies like recently came out about 13,000 thousand years of uh, Amazonia and th they had they had structures every bit as equal to uh, you know the most sophisticated places in Europe uh, and they, the impact of humans was significant as it the impact of ants is significant that we're supposed to have a, an impact and the impact was uh, a, 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 an, a healthy Amazon without extinction rates you know without extinctions right and so, and this is, you know, this is going on today. Um, uh, I, uh, I had the uh, honor of being at a, at, a, at a meeting where some California state senators and people were talking about the water crisis a couple of years ago. And one of the, the speakers on the panel was the uh, chair, uh, chairman of the Chumash, you know, I think Kenneth Kahn was his name. And uh, turns out that per capita, the amount of water they saved compared to every other county in California, it was like three or 400% per capita better from the techniques they used. And so I got up in line really right away after their presentations to ask a question. And I didn't know how it was gonna turn out because Ken was in a suit and tie and I didn't know if he was uh, you know, one of the many that have lost the traditional ways or not. So I asked the question, uh, I, said, uh, I said, Mr. Khan, can you tell me if the Chumash spiritual traditions and, and the, the original worldview uh, had anything to do with your success. And I didn't know what he was going to say. And uh, I, I, I'll tell you what he said. I, I've got it here in writing. He said, and he said it with enthusiasm. He said, absolutely. That's the driver. Traditional water is provided to us by Mother Earth and whatever we take, we give back with tobacco or a prayer. It is the driving factor in how water is used. We are small, we can put restrictions in place and can sustain a degree of sacrifice, but no doubt it was our worldview that was the driver. And this respect is about balance and our relationship to all things. You know, this is two years ago, right? Beautiful. And, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so we're, we're all about getting back in balance with the earth. I think people talk about that, but they don't uh, necessarily talk about the importance of the heart mind, the heart mindedness, that sense of being one with the tree, with the, uh, the wolf, <laughs> with the clouds that we're all entangled together, our biology, our DNA, our you know, our stardust, we are stardust, and we are all entangled together. Physicists are telling this to us now. Our DNA, our viruses are going in and out of our bodies all the time. Uh, they, they make us stronger, typically. Um, and, and so we have to remember where we are. We're Earth creatures. We are here to help other, uh, the other than humans flourish. And that's what indigenous peoples have done in, with their place-based knowledge, which is not, again, not what we're talking about. We're talking about that more delocalized way of understanding how to be a human, how to be connected to nature, how to be connected with the cosmos, what we, uh, one of our colleagues calls the existence scape, right, of how to, to exist uh, as a human being in community with, the, in partnership with the earth. So um, again, we're trying to get people, uh, you know, uh, jiggle their understanding of things to start to move towards developing that heart mindedness. Our child ra raising cuts that off, right? If you leave babies in distress, young children in distress, you spank them, for example, or let them cry, they start to have to cut out their feelings because they're not respected. 
and I have to, you know, stuff them down, as my husband says. <laughs> and then you, what are you left with? You're left with that the instinct of survival systems, you know, not feeling safe. And so you're always bracing, bracing, bracing. Or you, and you go to school and then you're taught to, to reason and not be connected. Don't think about the birds outside the window. You know, don't think about what you really feel. Just learn this information, take a test. So we really have to decolonize education as well, right? And bring this kinship view into how we are. The native way, the indigenous way of learning, learning is about self-transformation. You're trying to build your virtue, build your community connection, build your gifts, your unique gift, right? Each child has one for the community. So I'm going to ask you the tough question that was asked of me not long ago. Do you think this transformation through education and through uh, uh, community engagement and, and all the different ways, media maybe, uh, in, in our movies um, and documentaries. Can we turn things around? That's uh, really a difficult one. I think each person can turn themselves around and then have a ripple effect on others. So it, for when I've taught uh, undergraduates, I tell them to and help them learn to self calm because your your energy is you know going out in the world and if you're anxious or or afraid or angry you know it's going to have ill effects on others so you want to learn to be calm and open hearted and generous and kind all the good uh, virtues that we talk about and then you need to build that social connection we played folk song games with one another because you have to be in the moment and that's growing your right hemisphere which is uh, you normally develop very rapidly in early life, but with under care, it doesn't develop properly. And so you're not as empathic, you're not as self-regulated, you're not as uh, aware of uh, transcendence. And the, so all this, you have things to do as an individual, as families, as communities, and we can build it out from there, but always in a sense of being connected to the place where you are, to love this tree and this river and care for this land here and not, you know, kill the spider you see. Say hello to the spider, welcome the insects, you know? So it's a different way of being, but be here now, right? It's presence, be so present. So you're saying, you're saying individuals, we can do it. And we've both seen that in your work yes. and, and in, in my cat fawn work where people look at, well, what is fear? Uh, how is indigenous uh, ways of thinking? Are, Why don't you, know, you talk about that now? Because our time is going. Yeah. yeah, well, it, it, you know, I had a, a near-death experience uh, trying to kayak down the Rio Uric River. And uh, we had a mountain lion and a, and a fawn that, that came into our uh, my partner and I's uh, experience and uh, had a vision of the cat and fawn that turned into letters. So it means concentration-activated transformation is cat, which is essentially the phenomenon that we talked about earlier, this self-hypnosis, this believing in an image and meditation. Uh, this healing. And we, we go into it easily, right? It's and just we, kind of a and, natural yeah. thing we do. Exactly. And we talk about that in the book. And then the four, we took four of the precepts, fear, authority, words, and nature, and, and show how different our dominant worldview regards fear and, 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 and is afraid of fear and how indigeneity uses fear as a catalyst to practice a virtue once the fight or flight mechanism is gone. That authority in the dominant worldview is generally exterior, you know, the, the father, the pope, the teacher, etc. whereas lived experience, honest reflection on it under the umbrella of everything being connected is the, uh, the highest source of authority. People think that, that we're a collectivist uh, when indigenous peoples, but really there's, we're, we're fierce autonomy, independence, but our independence is in behalf of the group. Um, words. Now we know we're in a post-truth world. The dominant worldview is, is uses language deceptively. You know, Kipling said it's our most potent drug. Words are our most potent drug. Um, in Tom Cooper's book, A Time Before Deception, shows that you know, words were sacred vibrations and our verb-based languages. So what you do is you look and you say, well, okay, the problems that I'm facing, what, what are the fears? And how can I use the virtues to practice a fear? What is the authority on this? And, and, and should that be the authority? Is it really true? What words am I using and are they accurate? 
And then the fourth one is in, fawn, F-A-W-N, nature. Have I used some nature, whether I'm in New York City and it's a, a weed growing out of the concrete or whether I'm looking at a squirrel in a tree, what can I learn? from the other than, than humans. So cat fawn is a very powerful technique that we talk about as a way to, 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 uh, to do this, this, tra this transformation. You know, I personally, on the, whether we can turn things around before they get too bad, for me, the definition of hope is not about an outcome. Uh, I don't think there's a really good chance we're going to turn things around, frankly, uh, in, in, at least in, a, in my lifetime. Or, or for the maybe, species? You mean for our if, species? If our, well, I think there's going to be... I'm, so I, I said that to someone up at University of British Columbia, and the, the next question was, they, they asked me if the worldview, we could do this turn around, like I asked you. And the next question was, well, why are you here? You know, and, <laughs> and, and, and I said, look, I want to be a human being. You know, and uh, I wrote a, a little, little monograph on Sitting Bull's words for uh, uh, a world in crisis. And Sitting Bull, you know, all, he didn't have hope. All the buffalo were gone. Smallpox was wiping people out. Worse than the pandemic we have now. You know, he, it was it was bad. But he never stopped singing. He never stopped uh, uh, creating songs or sun dancing or helping people or being generous or resisting or doing his. You know, it was like he's going to be a human being because he believed that we are, we are, we have these bodies that we have chosen and uh, that we're spirits that are inhabiting them and that will continue continue on and uh, in, in, in some way, in some way that is too mysterious for us to be able to identify, right? But um, someone's going to have to rebuild. And, uh, and so that's, that's why we, I, I wrote the book, you know, so that people that uh, are going to rebuild won't be using one of these post-apocalyptic movies as an example with white guys with machine guns and, and bullets on their chest or, or dragging a, a woman by the hair, right? That they'll actually be looking at the kinship, uh, the kinship worldview as a way to, way to do it. That's right. So uh, what world are we in, according to the Hopi? The fourth or fifth world we've, we've wrecked? <laughs> yeah, Four there is. at least, right? And so, yeah, it looks like right. we're doing it again and we have to start over. We're not going anywhere, right? We're all stardust. We're part of the universe. And we just, you know, when we yeah. die, if we die normally, we just become part of other animals and plants and the soil. Yeah. yeah. All right. So if we can just remember that relationships, responsibility, reciprocity, redistribution, instead of, I think you, you said in an interview not long ago, instead of the power and profit can guide us, then, uh, you know, certainly uh, the MISOC turned it around. Now, I know they already, they were closer to it, but they lost it completely. You know, the MISOC uh, of Southern Colombia had complete cultural, territorial, linguistic loss. Uh, and a lot of violence and suffering and alcoholism. So, um, you know, led by women elders, they regrouped and uh, and restored their place-based knowledge and the, the worldview that that represents. And today, only a generation later, you know, maybe 35 years later, uh, all of them speak their language, uh, uh, their, their, their mother tongue, uh, they know the ceremonies, they regained land wisdom, they're healthy, happy, strong. Nine out of 10 of those who leave come back. Um, and so maybe that's, that's more hopeful than, than my definition of hope, which is not about an outcome, but about what you're doing is the right thing to do, regardless of the outcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so you know maybe maybe what they lost is what we have all lost, and we can bring it back. So I'm anxious to hear to what if there's some questions out there in uh, in in the audience. I almost had forgotten about them. <laughs> well, let's see. I think we have to wait a minute before they come. All right. Uh, well, super. So let's see. Is there anything else that we should cover? Well, I think, I think one thing that that might yeah. come come up, or if we have time, a lot of folks say, "Well, wait a minute. What right do I have?" You know, an Indian country itself is is split on what right someone has to teach about indigenous anything. Now, certainly, we've we've made the distinction between place based wisdom, which requires growing up in a culture with the language and the ceremonies. But Fool's Crow, the White Standing Buffalo, Rick Two Dogs, people that I respect highly, uh, 
they all say that anyone who thinks that this medicine is, doesn't belong to all of us doesn't know the medicine, that we are indigenous to the earth, and, and, and that the laws of nature are obviously the, the thing that is most likely to tell us how to get back into balance. And those who have studied it for generations after generations with a language that's based on it came up with a worldview that, uh, you know, and, and so, and, and there's, there's, there's really no reason that you cannot learn that worldview. And, and I know most people think there's millions of worldviews. We're operating on the basis of Robert Redfield's work as the father of social anthropology, and just looking at when people have conversations about worldview, that there's really two. There's the dominant one, that we, and there's the, 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 there's the, the, the kinship-based one. And all religions and philosophies and cultures fall generally under one of them. So that might be helpful for folks to know. Yeah. Can I say something about how I came to this uh, perspective? <laughs> so I, uh, back in 2003, could not believe the United States went to war with Iraq on flimsy reasoning. And I, it was like, I couldn't sleep. It's like, what's wrong? What's wrong with everyone, uh, with people? Right. And so I, I read widely and anthropologists have found, you know, hunter gatherer childhoods are quite different from the, what we had. And neuroscience, uh, effective neuroscience, Yachtpank Sepp's work was showing how important it was, how the brain is shaped by parenting. And um, James Prescott looked at uh, peaceful societies and what was common among them. It was carrying your children and breastfeeding them for at least two and a half years. And so I started to put all this together. My area was moral development because how can people be so immoral, <laughs> right? And so I pieced together the neuroscience, the, the uh, childhood experience, and, as, and I proposed a book and I started to write the book and then realized in the middle of writing that book, the book always has a mind of its own, you know, uh, that the indigenous perspective was, I called it primal wisdom. This is what we need to return to. That's, you know, they knew how to do it. <laughs> we survived for six million years, right? And, uh, and so I came to this and I discovered you at a conference. It was like, oh, it was such a thrill <laughs> to know about your work. And that helped me pull um, pieces together. And uh, actually um, the book has won prizes, so. Well, you know, the synchronicity of, of the Iraq war, we've never talked about before, but that was when I first went uh, with my in, with, with my Lakota name. Up until that point in time, all my books were under my Irish name, which I'm equally proud of, Don Trent Jacobs. But I was so appalled by uh, the, the, the war on terror with 60 countries and then the, 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 the invasion, which seemed as illegal as anything you could imagine. And I, I painted myself... I wore my, because I, I, I had been a sun dancer and I had had the name for about 10 years, Wahinkpe Topa, but I kept it for only ceremonies. I didn't, I didn't go, I didn't write with it. I didn't ask people to call me by it. But on that, just like you, you know, I was so, I went out and did a vision quest and I was told it's time to put this out. And uh, I came, I had a, a, a white, a white on my eyes and uh, and and wore uh, in indigenous attire, my deerskins, to classes at Northern Arizona University. My family got mad at me because I was riding under four arrows instead of Don Trent Jacobs. Uh, my colleagues, I mean, it was a it was a nightmare year that I did in that transformation to go from Don Trent Jacobs to Forrest. But I never knew that we both had that that same <laughs> that same trigger. moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and I uh, people might wonder, well, why am I writing about indigenous things? Now, I am half Puerto Rican and have Taino blood. Um, for virtually all Puerto Ricans do, and I guess mine's around ten percent. But you know, the Taino were absorbed, uh, wiped out, or absorbed, and so there isn't that place-based knowledge. You know, uh, is just not what I grew up with but I did grow up half my childhood outside the United States. So that gives you perspective when, when you do that and you come back and you see what's wrong. <laughs> Why are things so unethical? And my little child brain was going, something's wrong with the world. <laughs> Even back then. 
Well, I think we have to have empathy, though, for all of those uh, people. Are the, the I'm talking about our our native indigenous uh, brothers and sisters who are worried about uh, misappropriation because certainly everything has been stolen. You know, even I'm I'm seeing now sage bundles being sold commercially and they're wow. being harvested commercially instead of us going through the process that we go through and the ceremony of getting that sage and, and it's sacred, you know. And so I understand I don't I don't have fault with with that division be in in, in Indian country about whether we should decolonize school. That's where you know, don't even think about it because that's where everything everything goes wrong is in school. And, you know, yeah. but I, I disagree with it, and so do a lot of, of of my other brothers. I think there's a those who are saying no, we cannot share this, or are, are, are people that are not quote uh, you know indigenous who still you know. I think that they have a, a more anger than than they should they should have. To, to make the the changes right yeah. and uh, um, and 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 but the sad thing is is that like I would say seventy percent of the Navajo nation this is according to my my own Navajo students who are all getting doctors to try to bring back traditional ways to their to their nation they're saying about seventy percent have 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 moved away from their spiritual traditions moved away from uh, uh, ceremony and and uh, and so we're all in the same boat and and I understand that problem Matic, but um there's not enough people who who uh, are there for us to turn it around so everybody should get aboard this and I hope yeah. that uh, that that will that will happen yeah my focus is the early life experience in particular the the evolved nest where the kinship worldview begins right and and how important that is Everything that we needed to know, we learned in kindergarten, but you have expanded that to, to even in the womb. And, and it is true. Um, that's got to be, you know, whatever we can do outwardly, if, if it, it has to wind up there for us really to make the turnaround. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's so ex exciting. I have questions now. Are you ready? Sure. So I'm going to start with this one. How do we begin to heal? How do we start incorporating this indigenous worldview right here and right now? So I well, think our book is all about that. Yeah. Yeah. Our book is all about that. People that have are doing things like Kundalini yoga, uh, where, where the, the precept is uh, to get in touch with breath and, and how that breath is connected to the world, to recognize how beautiful you are. Uh, and, and, and everything kind of stems from them, uh, you know, because not everybody can get out into nature in, in, in the kind of ways for that kind of a meditation. So, we, you know, those, those, those traditions, uh, whatever um, kinds of traditions you have where you can bring in the precepts that we're talking about uh, can give you that, that, that piece. Learning the, the self-hypnosis so that you can begin to heal. Trance-based healing is how people have healed for, for many, many, many thousands of years. Paying attention to the moon phases, honoring the, the new moon and the full moon and the sunset and the sunrise and just be on the earth and be connected, right? Right. Here's another one. How do we get non-indigenous organizations that say they support decolonization to understand what it truly means. That's such a tough one, but that decolonizing movement is 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 happening. But it, I, the, the question is, if we just focus on what's done, that's being that's incorrect and that's hurtful, or that that's not respectful, or that's not inclusive, the resistance is going to continue to be there. If we can focus on what was lost. And that's the kinship worldview. I'm finding, uh, and, and, I'm, and I've been in, in corporations and businesses and, and, and tough academics uh, are starting to move when they begin to look at, at the worldview chart. So I think that's a good question. And that's, that's, I'm glad to get someone asked to ask that. Yeah, I think it's, it's difficult without having seen the role model of what it looks like, right? And I, that's where reading uh, anthropological accounts helps. Uh, the, the dawn of everything helps. And other books um, that show us that we don't have to be this way. 
It's not normal to be this way as a human species. Uh, so to wi widen your reading uh, and then to bring those examples up wherever you are in the workplace or in the institution uh, to try to expand people's imagination. Sometimes it takes, you know, 10, 15 times of exposure to an idea before someone believes it. So you have to be persistent. <laughs> Here's another one. What is your advice? Uh, oh, sorry, this one first. Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer asked the question, what if the land loves us back? Should we be asking the same question of other living beings? How might this help to transform our relationship? Well, it, you know, Robin is a good friend of ours, and and was uh, at, at our at our conference, and and uh, uh, is so eloquent in in, in her words. Uh, and how do you know if an animal loves you back? People have that have cats and dogs; they certainly can can see it there. But you know, uh, we uh, we have done a lot of work with um, uh, going out into nature and, and having a sit spot and, and, and having children uh, of all ages and adults as well get used to being comfortable in a wild spot. And, and, and pretty soon they start to see wild creatures showing a, an empathy, a, a, a caring. Uh, and uh, you know, I, of course, I've had, if, if people go on YouTube and put in wild horse hypnotist, you'll see me with uh, the, the wild horses that have taught me this. But um, there's no question that she's, that she's right about that. And if the question is, how do we perceive of that? It's doing the things that you said. Yeah, we know that if you talk to your plants, your house plants, they grow better, right? And so... Talk to the plants that in your garden. Talk to the trees. Uh, I, I greet the trees. We did an experiment uh, some years ago that was published trying to get uh, undergraduate students on college students to start to think and be more connected to the natural world. And so they, the experimental condition, they had um, they came in and did a pretest, and then they got to pick 21 things uh, that were they were going to do the next three weeks, one a day. They pick one from the envelope and do that all day long. And then they came back for a post test and we were trying to increase their ecological attachment. So they did things like pay attention to the clouds today, acknowledge the trees as you walk by, because this is on campus. So we knew they were walking by trees uh, and their ecological attachment increased. So just little things like that, pay attention to where you are and what's alive around you, what's breathing around you, right? And acknowledge them as part of your kinship web of life. Beautifully said, sister. Here's another, what's your advice for how we can proceed? What resources should we access to learn and love more? Well, the obvious answer is, is, is to, uh, is to get uh, our audio book, our Kindle, or our, our the, the hardbound copy of, of our book, because we've got 28 of uh, indigenous voices that uh, we've chosen quotes that really resonate to inspire. And then Darcy and I will, uh, you know, we, we, we have the kind of dialogue that we're having now and talk about ways to, to, to do that. But uh, it, that, the, the most important thing is to move into courage and then from courage into fearless courage. And this is something I've learned by living with the Kunchak and the Raumari and, and uh, the, the traditionalist and, and, uh, and with the Oglala, etc. that you get to a place with courage alone and it wears you down. So I know a lot of activists that burn out, you know, just having the courage to, to go in and talk about this, even at, at your workspace without being humiliated. But if you move from courage to fearlessness, that means that you have made the decision to act. And once you do that, you trust the universe. So regardless of the outcome, you're not having to bring courage as an emotion into this anymore. You just go forward. And uh, that's when the, the, you know, the, the really sensibilities of seeing the world fully and clearly come to being. So working on, on fearlessness with the cat fawn process 
uh, and doing that self-hypnosis and doing an in vivo exposure to, to, sh to show that it works. Another idea is uh, to what you brought up earlier for arrows, the sit spot, to go find a place in the natural world where you go routinely, regularly, usually at the same time, for the, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes, you sit there. And over time, you'll notice more and more, and the animals will get used to you and will show up. Uh, this is John Young's uh, work. Uh, he's got uh, at eight shields. Uh, he has a lot of ideas for how to build nature connection. And he's in our book from our conference, Indigenous Sustainable Wisdom. And uh, so I would encourage you to look him up and the kinds of activities uh, that he suggests all these games we used to do it when I was teaching the undergraduates we do some of the games he uh, where you act out as an animal and and you get your 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 senses just get activated when you're playing roles of different kinds of animals and, and of course you know protests and non-participation and organizations and systems as best you that you can that are that you know are are so locked into the the violence against uh, others um, there, there's a lot of lot of opportunities to not be a part of it, uh, as difficult as a sacrifice that that can be sometimes. Yeah, and to to also then find native peoples wherever you are and try to uh, support their uh, their work, their uh, guarding their place based knowledge. Our all our the profits from our book are going to native peoples. So. Um, another one. What is currently bringing you joy? I know. I know the answer for you. Surfing. Yes. <laughs> I've become a 76-year-old surf bum. Uh, I, I, I'm living here on the uh, in Nahuatl land on the Costa uh, Costa Alegre, the Happy Coast, and uh, we have the best uh, longboard surfing in the world. I'm not. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Now I'm going to get more people here. But um, that and music, uh, we have a band and, and uh, so playing music, but being out on the, on the water uh, and just waiting for a wave with the pelicans and the jumping fish and uh, uh, all of the things that are out there uh, is, I'm very, I'm very, very, very fortunate to, to have that experience. But everyone has their own, their own little ways of finding it. The, the important thing is, is to find it and to, and to live it. Yeah. My, my joy, it comes from dancing to a Brandenburg concerto. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm an organist, so, you know, I love jazz Bach and being silly with my husband. And we sing to each other and we dance around and <laughs> just playing all day long. <laughs> all right. Another one. What role would a full repudiation of the doctrine of discovery play in embracing kinship relationships? Huge. Uh, and in yep. and, and one of my books, Vine Deloria Jr. wrote a chapter called Law Mask or Conquest Masquerading as Law. And the doctrine of discovery is built into the constitution of three countries, the United States, Canada, and Australia. Um, uh, and, until it's recognized and, and uh, which is a, is a huge, huge uh, bailiwick, of course, uh, we're going to continue to have uh, legislative and legal support for the colonizing, the continuation of colonizing. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a huge, huge uh, factor. And most people don't even know what the doctrine of discovery and its horrors are. So thank you for that question. All right. Thank you. Another one, is there an indigenous practice similar to what we call somatics to release trauma from the body? Well, I can start by answering that John Young uh, has uh, done a lot of work with the San Bushmen. Now, the San Bushmen in Southern Africa, we have genes from them. They've been around for about 150,000 years at least, and they are our kind of living ancestors in a way, and they will have healing ceremonies and he asked them how often oh a couple times a week for grief right and what does that mean that means they're dancing they're singing they're drumming they're moving their bodies they're crying expressing right their feelings and getting back in balance right and we need to do that kind of thing to, because our emotions that we don't release or our resentments 
are like Velcro on our bodies and they weigh us down and we need to let them go in some fashion or another. Ideally with a community where you feel uh, supported and connected. But, yeah, body, mind, spirit, you, you said that beautifully, but the, the holistic nature of, of, uh, of, of this worldview uh, is body, mind, and, and spirit, body, mind, and spirit. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's unavoidable if, you, if you're really a nature-based person. Right. So I think there's ways to just go lie on the earth, right, and hug a tree, lean against a tree. Those things are going to help calm you down, and it's very body-centric. Body so that was the last question. So we need to uh, close up. Uh, I think we're very grateful for this opportunity. CIAS is really a marvelous place. We're just thrilled to be aligned with uh, its work. And we're happy that we had uh, people interested in our book and hope that it inspires everyone to actually have some hope of the active kind <laughs> to change your behavior to change your mindset and adopt the kinship and act as a kin member, <laughs> kin centric world. Yes, if people would look at uh, at the chart and say, what if, what if we all did this? What would be different? It'd be the way. So um, I would just like to uh, to close my portion with a with a Lakota prayer that I, I would not be able to put into English, but it talks about all the things that we have done in terms of uh, uh, our uh, giving gratitude for the interconnectedness uh, and, and the hope for the balance that we, we all deserve to have. Tunkashila wakantanka namakompo na tatewa topo unshibaka Oyate oyasin chanku luta och namani oichakiapo Oyate oyasin unchi wichalapana oichakiapo Hachu wich was ani washte unyo api Mishanti a tawa wograke, a hani lako which you want to cash you like kiss you. Metako yoyasi. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And now it's, uh, I'll bring back Alex to close us out. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. We hope you'll join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded, so if you'd like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at this same link and later on our Facebook page. We're also going to feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening.